This is Women's Leadership Success, episode number 114. Are you aware that girls bullying other girls impacts the way women treat each other in the workplace? Do you know that today's technology-driven social media age has radically changed the stressors that young women and girls have to deal with? We need to help them build a strong sense of self and develop the confidence they need to confront negative societal expectations and make healthy, positive decisions. Listen to today's show to understand the unique challenges girls and young women face, the future impact on society and business, and what you can do to ensure they become the next generation of confident female leaders. Welcome to Women's Leadership Podcast, showing you how to influence people, improve your performance, and advance your career. Brought to you by women's leadership and career expert Sabrina Brom and womensleadershipsuccess.com. Here's your chance to meet women trendsetters leading the way to success, accomplishment, and balance in business and life. No matter if you're a manager, CEO, or entrepreneur, join Sabrina for coaching and no-nonsense advice to improve your career and bottom line. And today we're talking to Dr. Lisa Hinkleman, author of Girls Without Limits, helping girls to succeed in relationships, academics, and careers, and in life. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me, Sabrina. You, it's a delight. And before we started recording, we were laughing so hard that um, I know this is going to be a fun interview. <laughs> I um, have several things I can say about you, but my first question to you, maybe we'll answer some of those. So you're the founder and the CEO of the nonprofit Ruling Our Experiences, or, or ROX. Could you tell us a little bit about your organization and what services it provides? Absolutely. Yeah, so we call it Rocks for short, and we often say like being a girl rocks. Um, but our, our focus is on delivering evidence-based empowerment programming to girls. And so we do that through training and licensing school professionals, so school counselors, school social workers, and educators. And then they take this 20-week curriculum back to their schools and run it in small groups with girls. And so it focuses on confidence and self-esteem and relationship and conflict management. Um, we talk about healthy dating and standing up for yourself and academic and career development leadership. We kind of focus on all of the places of girls' lives where they're internalizing some negative or restricting messages about what it means to be a girl or what's available or accessible for them. Uh -huh. And then we give them some, some skills to push back against that. Um, so we run programs in schools uh, across the country. So we have about 500 programs in 22 states. And then we do large scale national research with girls and then workshops and trainings for adults who have girls in their lives. So parents and teachers and school counselors were really centered on how we equip the next generation of females to not be held back and to be the leaders that, that we so desperately need. That's so wonderful. Uh, and because I do research almost every day, it's one of my passions. Do you have any um, statistics that prove this is helping? Yeah, so we do, actually, Rock started out as a research study. Um, mm -hmm. I was a professor at Ohio State and um, the, the work, actually, I wrote a little grant to start this program. And so we just extensively pre and post tested our curriculum to understand like how girls were changing, what new skills they were acquiring and how they were interfacing with the world differently. Because, you know, as someone who's interested in research, you, you see all kinds of things like 87% of the girls loved their participation. Right. And I'm less... Um, I'm less convinced that that's an indicator of success than <laughs> girls are doing things differently because they were part of your program. And so some of the things that we see, we see increases in girls' levels of confidence and self-esteem. So we do pre and post-test measures around that. We also see pretty big increases in girls' conflict management and ability to communicate assertively and stand up for themselves. Um, this is one of the areas where we know a lot of girls struggle 
They struggle to speak their mind. They struggle to have healthy, respectful disagreements. They struggle to share their opinions. And um, in our national research, we learned that about a third of girls say that they are afraid to be leaders because they don't want people to think they're bossy. And so we know that even, even the idea of speaking up for yourself can be really, really hard for girls. And so we're really proud of the outcomes that show that girls are more comfortable in their own skin and with their own voice. Um, and one of the other metrics I think is really important is girls' acquisition of violence prevention skills, abilities to set boundaries and, um, and, and assert those boundaries in situations where they feel that there could be some coercion or some pressure. Um, and so we see a, a tremendous increase in girls' ability to navigate some of those hard situations. That's wonderful. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Some of these things that you teach people in your workshops and, and are in your book. Um, but my, I wanna say my audience are women, mostly 30 to 65 who are in some management position in companies or in the military, why should this matter to women? Just oh yeah, I I always what if think not that, a mother. What if yeah. not a mother? Why should it matter? Yeah, I mean, I think that this topic matters to everyone, not just to women, not just to moms of daughters, not just to dads of daughters. Okay. You know, when I think about cultivating leadership and becoming a leader. We know very clearly that the challenges that we face during our growing up years, drops in confidence, uh, difficulty with assertiveness, um, difficulty speaking our mind, it, it, you know, feeling uncomfortable in our own skin or struggling with body image, all that stuff persists for us as grownups and persists for us as, as adult women mm -hmm. in ways that continue to hold us back. And so when we think about what our role is, I think our role in, in our current leadership capacity is to recognize the areas that might still plague us because the research shows that women don't begin to rate themselves as more confident than men rate themselves until they're in their mid forties. Mm -hmm. And so most of us are well into our careers at that point and probably have made some decisions that maybe weren't the best decisions for us because we didn't think we belonged. We didn't think we were smart enough. We didn't think that we had the right skills or tools. We didn't think we had every list of competencies that the job called for. And so we held ourselves back. So I think there's a dual or really a parallel process here. Part of it is what are we assessing about our own leadership development? What are the insights we need to develop about ourselves? But simultaneously, how are we bringing along, mentoring, supporting, encouraging, and empowering the young women in our lives and the girls that we are parenting? So I don't think it's just a, oh, let's learn about this so we can help the young people. It's let's talk about this so that we're actually investing in preparing current leaders and the next generation of female leaders. Oh, beautiful. I, I love that answer. Now, um, teens and preteens, they get pretty closed off to adults. What do you suggest to help um, get that relationship where you can communicate better to them? Yeah, I think that's this is one of the biggest challenges of the teen years, of course, is that teens uh, begin to strive for independence. And, uh, and parents don't want that because they've had such close, communicative, supportive uh, relationships up until that point that they're not comfortable with kind of letting their young ones go. And the teens are like, I need to go find my way, like, get, let me alone. And so that, that friction and that tension uh, can, can exacerbate small conflicts and it can make communication and trust really compromised. And so I think one of the things that what we hear from girls is they say that adults don't understand me, they don't get my life, and actually they don't, they don't care. And when I talk to the adults, they, they do care. And they say so much like, I was her age and I totally understand what she's going through. Mm -hmm. 
And the girls are saying like, you, like you were my age, like a hundred years ago. Like you don't (laughs) know what I'm going through. Like the world is not the same. Uh And so the adults kind of want to dig in and say like, no, I do understand it. And I'm relevant and I'm cool and I'm hip and I'm right. And, and I think that that kind of, that kind of friction only draws the relationship further apart because as adults, we shouldn't be trying to convince the teens in our life that we get them. We shouldn't be trying to like help, help them understand, no, I would, I get it. I know what it's like to be in eighth grade. I know what it's like to deal with pressure. Mm-hmm. We need to instead shift that conversation to tell me what it's like. You know what? I, I was in eighth grade once, like a really long time ago. And so I know it was hard for me. Tell me what it's like for you mm-hmm. because it's really different. And so sometimes we have to take the, the expert hat off and give that expert hat to our girl mm-hmm. and say, man, you're the expert on your life. Mm-hmm. You know best what it's like to be you. You know best what it's like to be a teen girl right now. Let me in, show mm-hmm. me, tell me about it. Right? Yeah, Lisa, I, I think it, no matter what age you are, that if somebody says to you, I know what you're going through, I've been through that, it's such a turnoff. <laughs> I, it, yeah, because it, it, I want to tell know. my story. I don't want to hear your story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, because how you we may have had like the same situation happen to us, but our reaction to it could have been totally different. Right. Like your parents might have divorced when you were in fifth grade and mine did, too. And I would say, oh, my gosh, like I know exactly how you feel. And right. for you, it could have been a relief because they fought so much and it was so much tension. And when they separated, it was like, oh, this is this is so much better. And for me, it could have been devastating. Right. So it's like the same situation, but our experiences are so markedly different that we we have to allow the other person to, to tell us their story and validate their realities and I don't know. I, I, I think people like to be the experts on themselves because <laughs> nobody knows you better, right? It's true. It's so true. And so my next question was, how do we show we care? But you kind of answered that. Is there is there more that you would say about that? I mean, I think w- what I hear from girls is they want to spend time and they want you to make time for them. That's also free from distractions and technology. As much as adults are complaining that girls are always on their phone, girls are complaining that their parents are always connected as well. So they they want that designated time and attention and space. Girls also talk a lot about not wanting to be judged and just wanting to be listened to. Mm -hmm. That if they come to us with a problem, they're not looking for us to solve it all the time. Sometimes they just want to vent. They want us to listen. Mm -hmm. They just want to get it off their chest. And sometimes we come into the situation like, all right, I'm going to take care of that. Who do I need to call? Let's talk about what you can do. And she's like, oh my gosh, no, don't do that. I just wanted you to listen. Right. And our self, our our protection of her comes in, right? Because we want to insulate her. But sometimes that's not what she needs either. And so figuring that out of like, okay, you shared this with me. Tell me what you'd like to do next. Mm -hmm. Did you just want me to listen? Do you want to brainstorm some things together? I think that helps build that connection and respect for the relationship. I think that's true. And I also think it's important to have time alone. I'm uh, just in the last couple of weeks, a vice president of a company, a woman said, I said, do you spend time with your daughter? Because she was complaining about her 12 year old and difficulty. And she goes, well, yes, I said alone. And she said, oh, no, she's always with her 10-year-old brother when we're driving to and from school. So that alone is something I find that people don't understand the importance of that. Yeah. And also, I think alone where you're not, where you don't have an agenda. In other words, did you get the trash taken out? Did you do the dishes? How's your homework? Just no agenda. And I think, I mean, we can be guilty of that with our husbands or wives or partners or anybody, but that time alone where it's just to connect and not solve anything or 
Yeah. Cause it says like, you're important to me and I'm here for you. And I mean, you know, if you're, if you're with one other person versus two other people, how different the conversation can be because you shift what you talk about. It becomes less personal and it's, it becomes, it can become a bit more superficial when it's one-on-one, it's just all about you and that connection with that person. And so I agree fully with you is making time for, if you have two kids, making time for one at a time every now and then has them feel special, probably will make you feel pretty special along the way. And, and I think allows for a deeper, more meaningful connection on a regular basis. Yeah, I totally agree. What, what are the issues we should be aware of? And I realize, having read your book, there's so many different ones. Um, maybe in what do you think are the top three issues? Because there's so many in your book. The book is yeah. Girls Without Limit, Helping Girls Succeed in Relationships, Academics, Careers, and Life. Definitely worth getting a copy of. But what are the top three that you think we should be aware of? I would think um, if I had to identify one, it would be the drop in confidence that girls experience between fifth and ninth grade. So we did a research study um, with over 10,000 girls uh, across the United States. And what we saw was a 26% drop in confidence between fifth and ninth grade. And then it didn't recover throughout the rest of high school. And so when I think about the role of confidence in our lives, it's everything. It's connected to every decision that we make. Mm -hmm. So we know that more confident people make better decisions. They make better decisions in their relationships. And so when I think about girls, I think girls often find themselves in in, uh, high stress relationships that are full of conflict and often drama. And, And I know that when girls are more confident, they can stand up for themselves better in those relationships. They'll leave they'll more readily leave unhealthy relationships. When when girls are more confident, they will make healthier choices when it comes to their academics or their career pursuits. Every aspect of decisions is centered in how we feel about ourselves and our own abilities. And so I think we really need to pay attention to what girls are experiencing during those years and ensure that we're helping bolster her confidence and give her opportunities to build her confidence. Mm-hmm. Now, okay. I think so often we think of building confidence as a, let's just give a lot of compliments and tell her how great she is. Mm-hmm. And that's really not how we build confidence. So I think when we think of what do I need to give my girl to help her build confidence, it's experiences. It's opportunities to grow her set of skills in areas that she's still emerging in. It's helping provide safe places for her to be vulnerable, for her to not get everything right, and her to learn and grow from that. So I think the confidence would be the number one issue, I would say, uh, that influences every other chapter probably in in that book. I think the second area I would identify is social media. Before you you go into the second one, uh, um, years ago I lived, on a piece of property where there were two houses and I'd lived there since this little girl was two years old. And at 11, she knocked on my door one day with the most horrible look on her face. And I said, what's going on? And she said, I have ugly knees. And I went ugly knee. I mean, it was a part of the body I'd never even thought about, you know, it was like ugly knees. And what I'm wondering is why does it seem to be more of an issue for girls than for boys? Oh, yeah. (laughs) So, oh, so many, so many ways to answer that. Um, One of the things that came up in the data is that along with that drop in confidence, Mm -hmm. at the same time between fifth and ninth grade, there was about a 30% increase in the percentage of girls who want to change their appearance. So we know that confidence is connected to body image and appearance for girls at very high rates. I think one of the reasons is that as a society, we really focus on girls and women's appearance more than we focus on anything else and much more than we focus on the appearance of boys and men. 
Mm-hmm. So that, but when girls are very small, they are starting to hear messages about how they look, about what their hair looks like and about their clothes. And I mean, if you, if you saw a little girl, right, if that two or three-year-old girl came to your house and your house was full of people, everyone who interacted with her would say, oh my gosh, you are beautiful. Look at you. You're gorgeous. Hey, I want you to meet my neighbor. And everyone would say, oh, she's precious. She's beautiful. So I think the earliest experience that girls have is adults reinforcing her for how she looks. Then as she gets a little older, it comes from all other places, the media and her peers, her classmates, advertising. And for us, we notice appearance first Mm -hmm. and then everything else that that little girl is second. We, you know, we don't, recognize her intelligence or her creativity or athleticism, the effort she puts into something because we notice how she looks. And so she's like, oh my gosh, she is so pretty and she's smart or she's beautiful and she's super athletic too. It's like, she has to be this and then she could be all these other things. Mm-hmm. So or I, know- I hear they're not pretty. I'm thinking of Diana Vreeland, who was head of Glamour magazine And she was raised believing she was the ugly child and her sister was beautiful. Yes. So there's even that kind of message that comes across to girls of she's not as easy as the other girls, but she's smart. Right. And there's these standards of beauty, right, of what is considered beautiful. And it's very Eurocentric. It's very focused on that body, ideal body shape. Right. And so if a girl isn't that, which most aren't, um, then she's not good enough. She's not skinny enough. She's not pretty enough. She doesn't have the right eyebrows or hair or teeth or whatever. And I think that consistent message, which connects to what they're seeing on social media, the next part of the problem is that they're comparing their real bodies and their real appearance to appearances that have been filtered and changed and augmented in ways where what they're seeing isn't real. And so they're never going to look in the mirror and feel like, okay, this is good. Cause they're always looking at something that is nearly perfect. I don't even know if we have time for me to ask this question, which is, is there anything we can begin to do to change that? If I see a little girl, what's a better thing for me to say to her than you're really pretty? I know. Well, I think there's all the other things about her. I think to ask her a question about what she likes to do or what's her favorite subject in school or what's the last book she read or let's play a game. What's your favorite one? Or tell me about your hobbies or it's so good to see you. Wow. What, what a profound thing to actually find out who she is and appreciate that as opposed to what you overlay onto her. Wow. That's really a beautiful piece of advice. I mean, I think it always feels good that someone notices us, but they can just notice us because we're here. Like Sabrina, I'm so glad to be with you today. Beautiful. I love it. And you said number two was social media. Tell us about that. Well, I think one of the things, I mean, I've been doing this work for 15 years. And when we first started, uh, when my research first started in 2006, there was no social media yet. Like it was just getting started. Maybe my space was hanging out, but it wasn't a norm for middle school or high school girls to have a smartphone and be on, on social media. And obviously, as we know now, almost a hundred percent of middle school and high school students have smartphones and are engaged in some kind of social media. And I think what we've seen with that is um, an increase in self-consciousness, an increase in conflict, a decrease in Um, healthy communicative relationships. We've seen social media, you know, I mean, it's so powerful. It it is, it can shift elections and the way people think about things and, and entire movements can be, can start because of these shifts that, you know, then algorithms come into play and determine what we see and what's reinforced for us. And I think for our girls, they're trying to, during adolescence is these 
these tasks of development of making sense of yourself and learning who you are. And the, the overlay of social media means that the feedback that they're getting is on everything they post. It's on everything they wear, every comment they make. So it, it is incessant and continually reinforcing their behaviors, positively or negatively. So how do you monitor that or, or do something to help with that? Well, we know that uh, most girls report that their parents don't monitor their social media use very much. and But most parents would say that they do. So there's definitely a disconnect between what parents think that they're doing and what the girls think they're doing. Okay. Um, but so I think that when we think about monitoring and when I work, I work in a lot of schools and schools talk a lot about digital dangers and teaching online etiquette and all of this stuff. And they often bring in like police officers to tell the students, like, if you post anything inappropriate, you will be on the sex offender registry for the next 20 years. And, you know, and like stuff like that, that's kind of like that scared straight stuff that didn't, didn't work in the eighties, you know? Right, right. Uh, so, so I think one of the things we have to get away from is the scare tactics. Mm -hmm. And we have to get away from, if you do anything bad, I'm taking your phone away. Cause that's kind of the only recourse that parents feel like they have right now. And instead of treating it as a, as this tool of like, don't mess anything up. We have to treat it as a device and a tool that kids need trained on how to use. I often use an analogy of, of learning to drive a car. We, we turn 16 and in my state, you turn, I mean, at 15 and a half or so, you can get your driver's permit, which means that you can drive with an adult in the car for certain hours. You go to driver's ed classes. You drive for hundreds of hours with an adult. You learn how to drive in all of these conditions. And then you have to take another test to be able to get a driver's license. And then there's still some more restrictions for a couple of years along the way. But some, for some reason, when kids turn 16, we don't just say like, here's some keys, go out, good luck with it. Don't do anything bad with it. Cause I will take that car back. We, we prepare them. We spend time, we invest because we know that there's potential dangers. We don't do the same thing with a phone. We just say, it's your 10th birthday. Here's your new iPhone. And we put some like little restrictions on it and that's about it. And when we say things like, if you ever, don't you dare, if I ever see, I'm taking it away. We don't actually teach our kids to have open conversations with us about the challenges they see. We just teach them how to get more secretive so that we don't find them. Wow. That's and so I think part of it is like, let's help them know that they can come to us like, hey, I just got this picture that I did not ask for and I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. If our girls would come to us and say that and we could say, all right, let's talk about it. Let's talk about what you can do right now. Let's think about your responses. Let's think about that instead of, oh my God, who is that? I'm taking your phone away. Mm -hmm. And she'll never come to us when something bad or scary or threatening is happening mm -hmm. because we've already set the, the limit that I'm not the person you could talk to who will teach you here. Do you want to optimize your career, your leadership, your life to move to a more successful and powerful level? Would you like to help other women worldwide, just like you, have more influence, confidence, and success? Then here are three things you should do now. First, go to careerdevelopmentquiz.com for a free gift from me, a quick and easy career and leadership assessment you can complete in just three minutes. And when you get done, I'll send you your score right away plus some suggestions you may want to focus on that are the secrets of top leaders. You may even qualify for a free coaching session with me just for taking this quick self-assessment. Second, here's how to help more women worldwide just like you become more powerful leaders. You can do this by spreading the word about Women's Leadership Success podcast in your social media and by giving this Show a great review in Apple Podcasts, 
iTunes, Spotify, CastBox, Podchaser, or Podcast Addict. Plus, this really helps me too, and the show. I really appreciate it. Third, follow me on LinkedIn to get additional tips, articles, and other resources that will help you be successful. So that kind of leads into sexting. So if if they, the girl tells you, I got this picture, or my boyfriend wants picture, or whatever, or my girlfriend, whatever that it is, what what's a good approach on that? Yeah, that's so out of the realm of my experience. So yeah, yeah, I I I mean it is for many be, because we we just didn't grow up in that time where that was available or accessible, right. and I think. Sometimes we're like, how is that even a thing? But right. it's a thing. And, yeah. uh, and teens are are very open about it being a thing. And that our, our research shows that, you know, by the time girls are in high school, the majority have been asked to send a photo and say that most students do send sexually explicit texts and photos to one another. So I, I think the way to think about that is not to say, if girls, if you respect yourself, you'd never do that. Or nice girls don't do that. That's kind of our message to girls right now. Uh-huh. If, if you respect yourself, then, then that is not something that you should ever do. And if I ever find out that you did that, here's the X, Y, Z consequences. I think about what are the skills that are required for a girl to not send a naked photo of herself to somebody? Mm-hmm. There's actual skills involved and it's boundaries. It's knowing your boundaries and articulating them. Mm-hmm. It's being able to communicate your boundaries to others in an appropriate and assertive way. In a confident way. In a confident way. You yeah. Have to be confident to do that, really. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's dealing with the coercion that you might get after that. The, Mm -hmm. I promise I won't send it to anybody. You are so beautiful. I just can't get my eyes off of you. Gosh, I, you, you have no idea how much this means to me, right? For girls who are struggling with their self-confidence, the sweet talks along the way and the promises, um, can feel very flattering. Mm -hmm. And, and so it, it goes well beyond self-respect and goes into how have we taught her and how has she had the chance to practice using her voice, setting her boundaries, articulating her needs. For many girls, they don't have the chance to learn and practice that in any way. And so when they find themselves in those situations, the, the quick response doesn't come naturally. Mm-hmm. The panic can set in. And then when there's fledgling self-esteem coupled with a lack of skills, it's not a good recipe for a wonderful outcome. Mm-hmm. And so I think being willing and able to have open conversations so that she knows how to articulate her boundaries in person and on social media or online are important because setting boundaries in real life is the same as setting boundaries on social media saying, Hey, you're sitting too close to me. I don't, I don't actually don't want to back rub. You're making me uncomfortable. I'm not comfortable with that. I need you to stop. Mm -hmm. Right. So that real life learning and practice, we don't do a great job teaching our girls. I think I, I like what you said about practice. I sometimes think of it as scripting that especially with children or adolescents, you need to practice saying it like I'm not comfortable with that or that that's not OK with me until it gets comfortable to actually say the thing. And uh, it's it's one of the things we teach in in our program at Rocks um, because we call it verbal self-defense, right? It's okay. setting boundaries and speaking your mind. and. For many girls, it feels very embarrassing, right? To, to, to assertively communicate. At first, that it makes everybody laugh. It makes you feel uneasy. Your cheeks and neck get red. But then the more you practice, you're like, okay, I can do that. It's so funny because I'm taking a, a dog training class. And one of the first things they teach you is it's okay to say to the person who said, can I pet your dog? No, I'm sorry, uh, not right now. And for almost everybody in the class, even that's hard. So I, I really uh, understand what you're saying about 
we need to practice that verbal self-defense. I was rereading your book. I, I've read it several times, actually. Uh, you have a thing called Identifying Bullying and Relational Aggression. And I really, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I could say group gossip or spread rumors of other girls, post things on Instagram, Snapchat, or social media that could be embarrassing to another girl, ignore girls on purpose or intentionally exclude girls from my group, uh, make fun of their clothes, appearance, financial status, tell my friends who they can or should be friends with. Is this a, something that goes on a lot? And why, why, do you, why is this not a good idea? Or how do, you, how do you work with girls so that they understand that this is not to their benefit to act like this? Yeah. And unfortunately, it goes on more than we would ever want to admit. Um, when we ask girls, what are the biggest things going on for girls your age? The number one response that they said was drama girl drama, conflict in relationships. So what we know is that girls tend to use their relationships to bully each other um, differently than boys do, right? When, when we think about bullies, we often think about like a big kid and a little kid and then pushing up against a locker or kind of these sort of physical kinds of bullying. But what we know is that bullying more recently is less about physical and more about emotional and relationships. And for girls, that's even more pronounced. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about girl bullying or relational aggression, right? Being mean mm -hmm. through our relationships, mm -hmm. it's that gossiping and spreading rumors. It's deciding who can be in my clique and who can't. It's orchestrating the cliques in a, in a friend group. I think what is so destructive about it is that it's very passive aggressive, right? Mm -hmm. It's instead of communicating assertively with one another, girls will spread rumors or do things behind one another's back. Mm -hmm. And, and the destruction in that is, is so troubling. I think one of the reasons that we see this happen is that girls don't learn how to communicate assertively or speak their mind to one another. And so instead of saying like, you know what, Sabrina, I, I was really hurt that you invited like every other girl in the class to your birthday party this weekend. And I was excluded. I saw all those pictures on Instagram and it felt pretty, pretty awful. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying that to you, I'll just block you. I'll start spreading rumors about you. I will cut you out of my life. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so we don't learn those effective relationship navigation skills to have healthy, communicative and supportive relationships. And, and for girls, we really, the, the world reinforces competition between girls and women instead of collaboration and support. At mm -hmm. every age, at every stage, it's how am I prettier than you? How am I smarter than you? How do I do better than you? And how do I keep myself ahead? And I think when we foster that kind of environment for our girls, we, we encourage that kind of destructive, divisive behavior. And, and then girls learn that other girls are a source of competition and not a source of comfort or collaboration. Mm -hmm. and, and that's when we see these destructive behaviors persist, not just for young girls, although there is a peak in middle school of this relational aggression. Right. We see this happen in grown up life too. I mean, like think of every reality show where like the goal is a single rose or right. It's let's see how we can make these women be really, really mean to each other for entertainment. So it seems like that's best solved in groups at school, but not individually with parents. What do you think? Do you, do you well, so I think that there's a role for parents, of course, okay. um, in helping, you know, helping be the guiding force in their, in their girls' lives and, and helping them identify and, and reinforce these strong, positive and pro-social behaviors. But we also know that a lot of parents haven't had the chance to learn some of these skills mm -hmm. too. And so for us, when we can access these opportunities in a co-curricular way, right, where right. girls are having these experiences alongside their academic learnings, 
they have a chance to learn new things and new skills and then hopefully take them back and talk to their parents about them. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a bit of why we find school-based programming alongside community education and parent workshops to really be the sweet spot for where we have the chance to better move this issue forward and better inform not just parents, but female leaders along the way of, hey, these are some of the challenges. These are some of the things we need to address. And these are some of the things that continue to persist that you need to address in the workplace as well. Mm -hmm. And you do have some really great examples in your book of how to talk like this. Thank you. I really appreciate. You know, there's a brand new movie out. I just heard the the woman that uh, made the movie. It's a Disney movie called Red Panda. I've heard of it. I haven't seen it though. It celebrates um, and normalizes young girls getting their period. And it talks about it in the whole movie. So it's something boys and girls will, will see. I didn't talk about that growing up. I don't know about you, but I found it was kind of a secret. Yep. <laughs> and this whole red panda, you know, she her hair changes, you know, she's getting hair under her arms, pubic hair, and her emotions change, and she feels all out of sorts. And how much of just going through um, all the physical changes of the body and um, starting to get your period is part of the challenges that girls face that we really need to help them with. Oh, I think, I think that is a significant part, right? Because most of us, that, that happens between fifth and ninth grade, right? Where we see that confidence changing. Because we, our, our bodies are changing. Most of them, like some are getting bigger. Some aren't fitting into clothes that we used to fit into. Some are getting much more womanly shapes at very young ages. And so we're starting to get sexual attention in ways that we haven't before and that we're unlikely prepared for. And then we also have the hormonal changes that do impact our emotions as new feelings emerge for us. We tend to get much more self-conscious about our bodies um, and we tend to have bigger vacillations in the highs and the lows. I think the other part of it is that it, it, it is like some secret, like the stuff that ha- is happening for everyone we've not been able to normalize in a way where it's like, oh, okay, well, that's no big deal. Yeah, of course we should have pads and tampons in the bathroom because every girl needs them, right? So mm-hmm. so I think that part of it is instead of shying away from normal, typical, healthy um, development, we, we, we should, we're, we're like, we can't talk about that. We shouldn't do that. And I think like, it's never a surprise that a girl gets her period at some point. We should, she should be ready for that, right? Because we talk to her about it, not because we've never spoken to her about it. And so she's like super freaked out when it happens. And so I think sometimes it's that ability to prepare her and the ability to normalize, like, this is just super normal. And this, this means this is happening for you, you know? And I think that the more we can do that, the more we can uh, make her, her feelings feel like, they belong. I think one of the things that we find that's the power of a group and girls being in a group together is the feeling like that they're not the only one and that you're going through the same thing I am. And I actually, up until this point, thought my feelings and everything was super unique and so weird, but you're actually saying the same thing that you feel the same way. Gosh, that's so affirming. And so that is, that is power of girls being in a, in a group or space together of women being in a group or space together is that we have the chance to validate each other's realities is like, man, you're exhausted too. Or you feel that way too. Or you can't, you're struggling in that way. That is, that's really affirming and, and a very powerful force. Great. Well, we're going to run out of time because you are so interesting and this is so much fun. But so that we had number one, number two with social media. Number three is what's number three of the top three things. Oh gosh. Um, I mean, I guess I would, I would say it's leadership because I think that those, those are connected, right? Particularly confidence and leadership. Okay. Um, and, and we see such a lack of representation of, of women in 
leadership roles, um, particularly the higher level that you get, the fewer women are there right. in practically every industry. And I think some of that, um, some of that sense of belongingness or seeing myself in those roles or having a pathway to that experience is uh, those are well defined in early adolescence and throughout our growing up years of where we belong and what trajectory that we're on. And so that's why in the book, when I'm talking about uh, careers and leadership and where are all the women and thinking about some of that, it's because in this moment now, we can look at where we, we refine our own position, but we can only also look retrospectively and see what were the messages that we had as we were coming up that made us uh, make different choices. And then what are the messages that the girls that we're influencing, mentoring, um, or bringing along our hearing and seeing as well. Mm -hmm. So um, now I'm having to pick and choose the last questions here. I'm gonna ask you, what risk taking should we encourage girls to take? I know this is such a hard question because you know no one wants their girls to be doing risky things, right? right. So, so I think there is a difference between being risky and encouraging risk taking, right? And by risk taking, I mean, pushing themselves in areas where they don't feel like they're perfect, mm -hmm. right? Our girls are little perfectionistic pressure cookers right now mm -hmm. and feel that like they shouldn't try something unless they can do it perfect on the first time. And if they don't do it perfect, then they just decide they're not good at it and just leave it be. And so when I think about risk taking, I think about trying out for a play or the choir or a musical or, or something that stretches mm -hmm. their competencies in ways that allow them to grow. And, and we have to provide those environments that are safe and supportive and that stretch us. And that's really how we help build new levels of confidence in our girls. Beautiful. And what areas do the girls need bound, healthy boundaries? Every area. Every area. <laughs> For us I mean, as adults, right? <laughs> I mean, it's so true. I think you need healthy boundaries to be able to say, like, it's not my turn to make the cupcakes. And you need healthy boundaries to be able to say, like, I don't want you to touch me that way. And we need healthy boundaries to tell our boss, like, no, that's my vacation. I'm not taking my laptop with me. And we need healthy boundaries to tell, you know, our partner, it's your turn to do the dishes, you know? So when, when I think about boundaries, I think that they apply to almost every aspect of our lives. That's beautiful. It's so true. I'm thinking of even, um, I'd be willing to talk about that, but this isn't really a time I feel up to it or something. So they even have the ability to not talk about something right in that moment. Because Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, any last words you'd like to leave us with? No, I think, I, I think the one thing that I would say is that sometimes we think about all of this stuff. And if we have girls in our lives, we often think about this and we're like, oh my gosh, I've been doing it all wrong. Or I've been telling, I've been telling my girl that she's pretty for the last 15 years. Now I can't tell her she's pretty anymore. Or, <laughs> you know, and so, so I think, I think that Everything that I've shared and, and all of the tips and strategies and conversation starters in the book are about adding on more good, right? It's not about like we have to stop who we are and to totally shift anything. It's let's just pack on a little more good. Let's uh -huh. just be gentle on ourselves and not say I should have done that or I totally did this wrong. But let's just say like, here's some new things I can do starting tomorrow, uh -huh. And, and I think that if we're easier on ourselves and our girls see that they're going to be easier on themselves too, which is exactly what we want to have happen. Yes. So this has been incredible. I've really, really enjoyed this. And before we started the program today, you said you were doing teaching these courses in schools and in companies. How would people get a hold of you to find out more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So our website is rulingourexperiences.com. Okay. And then my email is just my first and last name, which is Lisa Hinkleman, H-I-N-K-E-L-M-A-N uh -huh. at rulingourexperiences.com. 
Um, and if you Google either of those, like my name or ruling our experiences, lots of things will come up. Um, and you can shoot me an email or go to our site or even on social media, we're at being a girl rocks.com or at being a girl rocks. Um, and then me or a member of our team can, can reach out and talk to you about what it looks like to start a program at a school. Um, what it looks like to do programming in a community organization or in a company or corporation for your women's group, for your women's BRG. We've been doing a lot of that um, this month and um, continue to do that because it's it's helping develop the, the future leaders and the current leaders um, that we all want so much. And so whether it's in schools with girls, um, in university settings with college women, or in, in companies that are rapidly growing and looking to elevate the opportunities for women. I think we have a space in all of that. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being with us today. And if you can't remember what she just said about how you can get a hold of her, it will be up on our website, womensleadershipsuccess.com. So you can check there too. Thank you again, Lisa. Absolutely. Thanks, Sabrina. Thanks for listening today. I really appreciate you sharing this podcast and social media and giving me a review in your favorite podcast platform. Also, be sure to follow me on LinkedIn to get even more free tips to help you succeed. And don't forget, if you're ready to take your leadership, your team, or even your whole company to a new level of engagement, success, and profits, and you need a top expert with decades of coaching, consulting, and training experience, I'm your best choice. Contact me today via messaging in LinkedIn, womensleadershipsuccess.com, or sabrinabrom.com. Thanks for listening. Thank you for joining your host, Sabrina Brom, on another Women's Leadership Podcast. If you have questions or comments, you can email her at sabrina at sabrinabrom.com. Since 1989, Sabrina and her team have helped hundreds of women managers, business leaders, and entrepreneurs with valuable trainings, articles, books, and executive coaching. For additional tips, interviews, and free access to Great Leaders Today mini-course, visit www.womensleadershipsuccess.com.